Hello, ISMers. We are approaching the end of the semester and it's one of my favorite times of the year. Yes, because the semester is almost over. Trust me, your professors get as burnt out as you guys do. But uh, also because my students are starting to get job offers, both for internships and full-time jobs. And I love sitting down with students and looking over the offers and having students ask lots of questions. For example, for full-time jobs, when my students get offers, they come to me and ask, is it negotiable? Would it be appropriate for me to negotiate the terms and conditions of this job offer? Let me begin by saying that in general, everything's negotiable and job offers are no different. And also, you're going into a field where negotiation is arguably the most important soft slash hard skill there is. Uh, think about it. You're going to be taking a job probably in a supplier buyer context and role. Do you think there might be some negotiation there involved? You're going to be interacting with other people in other parts of your organization, like engineers. Do you think there might be some negotiation required there? So the answer is yes, you can negotiate the terms and conditions of a job offer, and it's not going to turn people off. They're not going to pull the offer if you start to negotiate the terms and the conditions. So usually what students like to know is can I negotiate the starting salary? And my response is, sure, but usually students do so to no avail. One of the reasons is because companies in general, they do their homework and they make offers based on your market value. And usually uh, there are salary ranges and bandwidths associated with all jobs, including entry level roles. Companies have salary ranges and there's a low end, there's a high end, and there's a mid-range in every job description that a company typically has. And they want to do that so they have as much leeway and leverage as possible to make the hire that they want. For example, let's say there's an entry-level managerial position and they might hire someone that doesn't have a college degree and they can get that person at a discount. So they'll offer at the low end of the pay range. Let's say they have someone internally that has a degree and has a few years of work experience and the job might be a step down or a lateral move for that individual and they don't want to take a pay cut to take that job but the company really wants that person in that job so they might uh, make an offer on the high end of the pay range and usually for most college graduates when a company has a pay range for a uh, entry-level managerial position it tends to be in the middle the sweet spot and it's designed to be there uh, so you might think well so technically I could get an offer between the middle, what they've offered me, and maybe the upper end, uh, and negotiate with that range. And the answer is you could, but I always tell students, make sure you have tons of data at your disposal that, say, that says they have not offered you market value. So what I try to tell my students is, an average salary for a graduate from our program is around 60K a year maybe high 50s, maybe low 60s, but around 60K a year. The average salary for students graduating from top 10, top 20 programs per the Gartner rankings tends to be around 60, 62K a year. And Western is a uh, top 10, top 20 Gartner ranked program. So we've got data internally, and then we've also got other organizations that are converging on. The average salary for a WMU ISM grad is around $60,000 a year. Now, that's the average. What does the average student look like that graduates from our program? Well, the average GPA is a 3.3. The average amount of work experience is around two internships, if not more. So that's average, okay? So I think if you get an offer, and let's say you get an offer for 55K, and you say that's below the program average, and you show the company data that says the average is around 60, well, the company might come back and say, well, what's the average student look like? And then you have to ask yourself, if you have a 3.7 GPA and you have three internships and you're getting an offer for 55K, I firmly believe that that is below your market value. And I think what you have to do in these situations is present the data to an employer, make a rational argument for what your market value is, but then also understand what does average look like in the context of your resume and what you have to offer an employer. Uh, some of the best negotiation tactics I've seen students use are telling an employer, well, do you want an average student? Do you want a below average student? And most companies will say no. And the student will say, well, this offer is for students that are average or below average. 
I'm not average, and I don't think you're an average company, and I don't think you want to make an average hire. So I think those things are negotiable, but what usually happens is companies are smart, and they usually know what your uh, market value is, and they make offers accordingly. So I haven't seen too many students have tons of success with full-time job offers in terms of negotiating their starting salary. Uh, things that are more negotiable would be like a starting date, uh, a little bit on the vacation time, Basically, most of our students get job offers for 10 paid vacations a year. And at most companies, that's where you start. And then as you get more seniority and time of service with the company, they add on paid vacation days. So after three years, that might jump up to three weeks paid vacation a year. Then after five years, it might be four. And then after 10, you might get up to five. And four to five weeks paid vacation is probably the most that you're going to get in corporate America. Now the question is, how many paid vacation days are they legally required to provide you in a job offer? The answer is zero. They can actually make a job offer that says, if you don't go to work, you're not getting paid and we're not giving you any paid days off. Okay, that's up to them. For competitive reasons, to get the talent that they need, like college grads with ISM degrees, they have to offer around two weeks paid vacation. That's pretty much the going rate. I've had some students negotiate more vacation time, but that's still rare. And uh, you, again, you have to do it in the context of it making sense to the employer. So for example, I had a student from the Metro Detroit area uh, get an offer for 10 paid day va vacation days a year. And he negotiated, I think it was three extra, five extra days a year because he wanted to turn some uh, weekends into three-day weekends so he could drive back to Metro Detroit from the Moline, Illinois area, which is where John Deere's headquarters. He wanted to turn those into three-day weekends. So HR and the manager agreed, absolutely. So basically what you're saying is you're going to have like uh, three or four three-day weekends during the year to go back and visit family because let's face it, you're going to be a little homesick because it's going to be the first time you're going to be away from home and driving from Moline to Detroit is probably... I don't know, five, six, seven hours. So to try to do that in a two day weekend uh, might not be worth it, but in a three day weekend, it might be. So yeah, a student negotiated three or five extra days of paid vacation time. Uh, so again, I think where I see salaries most often negotiated are when companies make offers. And usually if they lowball you, it's not because they're trying to get you at a discount. Usually it's because they've made a mistake and they don't know what market value is. They don't know what the average is. Maybe they don't hire people every year. Maybe they hire people every three years, four years, five years. I've seen most of the mistakes made by small to medium sized firms, in particular for internships, where they make offers that are not at students market value and it's simply because they didn't know. So rather recently I've had some small to medium sized firms hiring our students for internships and they haven't hired students in a few years and they're offering our students like 10, 11, 12 bucks an hour and the students had to go back with data that basically said most students in this program in this major make between 16 and 22 dollars an hour for an internship so if you're a sophomore it's 16 bucks an hour if you're a junior it's 17 18 and then if you're a senior it's 19 20 uh, and usually as you go up the ladder in terms of credit hours and academic status freshman sophomore junior senior you make more money in internships so yeah everything's negotiable you just have to do it in the context of do you have the data to back it up do you know what your market value is and, uh, you know, I have a friend that says, don't start with the negotiation process on where you want to finish. So if you get an offer for 55 and you would take the job for 60, don't go back to them and say, uh, I need to make 60 K a year because they might come back at 57 K a year and it's hard to go up from there. So if you're getting an offer for 55, you want to make 60, maybe you say you need 65 so that when it's all said and done, you agree on 60k a year, which is, is exactly where you wanted to end up. You know, again, the problem with that, I think, is most companies are offering market value. Uh, had one student get a job offer from General Motors for 75k a year. Uh, what are you going to do? Negotiate with them and say that's not enough? I mean, they're paying the most for ISM grads and for people majoring in supply chain management. Are you going to say that there's someone else out there that offers more than 75k a year? And if there is, who is it? And if they do, do you have an offer from them? And if you do, show it to me. So I think when you ask for more money and you don't have another offer as leverage and you can't prove that someone's willing to pay you more or data to back up that 75K is uh, below your market value, you're going to strike out with that. Now, this one student in particular did go to GM and say, wait a second, you're hiring students with engineering degrees 
for the exact same job and starting them off at 77k a year. So I want 77k a year because we're going to take on the same job. GM comes back and says, well, our preference is people with technical degrees, even in supply chain management jobs. Uh, people with technical degrees, like engineering degrees, are in high demand and they're in low supply, and it's hard to convince an engineering graduate to take on a job in supply chain management. So finding those people is more competitive. So yes, even though they're taking on the same job, we're gonna pay a premium for them, even more so than we paid a premium for you. So he struck out there as well. I kind of understood uh, his complaint with, for the same job, someone was getting 77 and he was getting 75, but you're not comparing apples to apples there, even though the jobs are the same. That other person has an engineering degree, so they might have some skill sets, like technical skill sets, the ability to talk to engineers, that the supply chain student might not have. So as long as they can justify it and it's for competitive reasons and isn't uh, discriminatory in nature per civil rights laws, for example, uh, I think they're good to go. And obviously they've got HR experts that uh, make sure they're not breaking any rules and laws. Uh, so that's my little speech on negotiation. Reach out anytime if you're in a situation where you feel like uh, you need to negotiate something. Uh, and I'm going to have more to say on this in another video. Students are showing me their job offers and they're looking at this thing called a 401k or a retirement savings plan. And they'll get two offers and one offers for 60k a year and another one's for 63k a year. And they think all other things are perfectly equal. And then I look at the retirement savings plan with the company that pays 60k a year and I tell the student, you know what, this job actually pays more if you do this with your retirement savings and the student has no idea what I'm talking about because no one explained to him what uh, a tax deferred retirement savings account was and who at age 21 even cares. You should care if you don't want to work the rest of your life though. So I'll, that'll be in another video. Thank you.